Hi, I'm Brett Johnson, former United States Most Wanted Cyber Criminal. Now good guy. Or as the United States Secret Service used to call me, the original internet godfather. And this, this is the Brett Johnson Show. Today's episode, synthetic refund fraud, when we come back. So we are back on the Brett Johnson Show. Today's episode, Synthetic Refund Fraud. Well, what the hell is that, Bretty? Well, don't worry. I'm going to tell you what that is. But before I'm able to do that, we need to lay some groundwork. We need to set the tone. We need to explain some things before we can even get to that point. So that being said, let's start with this. Remember this as we keep talking today. 90% of every, over 90% of every single attack uses known exploits. Those people out there, those security pros, those media people, everybody else that talks about zero day attacks and unknown vulnerabilities and all that, well, that's bullshit. I mean, that kind of stuff's out there, but I want to tell you right now that if you're an attacker that's waiting on a zero day attack to profit, you are going to starve to death. I was over 20 years, over 20 years as a cyber criminal. Nothing to be proud of, I'll tell you that. I went to prison, all that stuff as well. Over 20 years as a cyber criminal. During that 20-year span, I had access to two zero days, only one of which resulted in profit. So pay attention to that. It's not the stuff we don't know about. It's the shit we've been told about for years that we're not doing anything about. That's the problem. So remember that statistic. 90% plus of every single attack uses known exploits. You remember that, and you'll go far in this game. Now, let's keep talking. So, hell, even before we get to that, I need to, I need to, I need to talk about this for a second. Here's, what's, here's another issue. We've got a lot of security companies. We've got a lot of consultants out there. And I'm going to be honest, there's many of them, most of them, do a very good job. There are some out there that don't. So I, I'm going to urge people to be aware of that. Before you hire a security company, before you bring on this consultant, because this consultant has claimed, oh, I can fix the problem. Oh, I know all about it. I know, I know everything. I'm aware of every single issue and I can cure your ills. Well, understand that if you own a business, your security, if you're basing your security on the reports of a, of a third-party company that's or an individual that's providing you threat intel, if you're designing security around that, your security is only as good as the threat intel that that consultant or that company is providing you. And the reason I say that is because some of these consultants out there Hmm. Well, they're only, I mean, they're, they're getting their threat intel from Google or from publicly available criminal channels or things like that, or they're copying some of it from me. I've seen a, a, I've seen a large increase of people that have, that have started to talk about the stuff that Brady talks about. So they say some of the stuff that I'm saying, but you know what? They don't really dive into it because they, while they understand the, the overall principle, they really can't start talking about it because they don't know what the hell they're talking about. So your security, if you're designing security around that type of threat intel, you need to make sure that the person that you're hiring or the company that you're hiring knows what the hell they're talking about. So today's episode, and this is going to be important as we're talking about this, because we're talking about overall refund fraud. We're talking about a crime that has been eating merchants alive for years, for years. And now we've got a set of consultants and some security companies that have popped up trying to make a fortune, trying to make their name, trying to build their business on this idea of stopping refund fraud. So we're going to talk about them today. Oh, you better believe we're going to talk about them today, but we're going to talk about this new attack vector that's that's online now. It's coming up that really no one's been talking about because all these consultants, all these security companies, they rely, not all of them, like I said, most of them are very good, but there are some that rely on Google or Brett Johnson talking about it or what they can find on 
you know, some of the public channels on, they'll go on dread on the dark web and see what, see what people are talking about, or they'll go on telegram, some of the public channels there. And the problem with that is that a lot of information that's been exchanged today is on privatized channels. It's on invite only channels or channels that you have to pay a fortune. Jeez, believe you me, you have to pay a fortune to get access to. And they're not willing to do that because they, <laughs> they don't think they need to. So just bear that in mind. 90% plus of every single attack uses known exploits. Bunch of security company consultants out there giving you half-baked or half-assed information that you're designing your entire security on. And we're going to talk about why that might be an issue or why that is an issue as this episode continues. So synthetic refund fraud. Before we dive into that, we need to explain, first of all, what synthetic fraud is. Second of all, we're going to recap what refund fraud is. All right, so turns out that Brett Johnson was kind of on the ground floor. Let me get a drink. Turns out that Brett Johnson was kind of on the ground floor of talking about, of being one of the first people to talk about both of these types of crimes. And it turns out I'm on the ground floor of talking about synthetic refund fraud today because ain't nobody else talking about it except some criminals behind paywalls, you know, on the private channels and everything else. So I like being on that ground floor. I do. I like being one of the first people to talk about it. So back, back when I began my career as a legal speaker, first uh, presentation I gave was to Bank of the West. Uh, I was invited in. They are an outstanding group. They truly are. I was uh, very thankful that they brought me in. You know, they brought me in. I had, uh, I'd never spoken to anyone before. So, uh, that was because of the CMP group. The CMP group, Carice Hendrick got me on and uh, invited me to keynote their conference. This was back, I don't know, geez, it's 2022. I mean, I've, I've lost track of time because of COVID. I still want to think it's 2020, but um, I guess that's been five years ago, maybe a little bit longer than that, that I keynoted their conference. So Carice invited me to keynote their conference. They announced it and then Bank of the West comes in and, and hires me to uh, to keynote a few of their uh, their conferences before I actually presented at CNP. So I went into CNP and, you know, I gave my story, which I always do that. You know, well, I'm not always anymore. I've got to the point where I don't have to constantly talk about the Brett Johnson bio. I mean, it's good. It certainly opens up the door. It's entertaining. It, uh, it's, it's a good story. You know, it's got that redemption arc to it. And we'll, we'll talk about it on the Brett Johnson show in a future episode. But I, I, I do more than just talk about my biography. I also talk about some of the new crimes that are out there. Some of the, some of the things that are coming online. Well, at the CNP conference, I spoke on synthetic fraud as well as refund fraud. So I was one of the first people. And I got to tell you, I got to tell you, pretty much it fell on deaf ears. I guess they were just more interested in seeing the criminal at that point in time talking. But I warned people about synthetic fraud and about refund fraud, and largely that fell on deaf ears. Today, we're going to talk first about synthetic fraud. We'll move over into defining refund fraud again, and then finally get into this new attack that's combining both that I like to call synthetic refund fraud. And the reason I'm calling it that is because, you know what, I'm the first SOB that's really talking about it publicly. So as such, I'm going to call it what I want to call it. I could call it Breddy's bad day, but I figure that might be a bad PR for Breddy. So instead, I'm going to call it synthetic refund fraud because, you know what, it makes sense. Criminals are very good about naming the crime what it is security people sometimes they're not sometimes they're not sometimes they struggle with a name and sometimes these security people struggle for months or years trying to define a crime while the crime's going on they're more interested in naming the crime than they are in stopping the crime i'm just saying i'm just throwing that out there because you know it needs to be said and gotta be honest with you i am that guy that will say what needs to be said so, synthetic fraud, 2011, the Social Security Administration, they randomized, they started to randomize Social Security numbers. Any new Social Security number issued 2011 and after, the number is randomized. Now, the reason that they did this, they did it to stop a specific form of identity theft. 
Turns out that if you're issued a social security number prior to 2011, which most of the people who are listening to this show, that's you. If you're issued that social security number prior to 2011, if I know, or if a criminal, I say I, because I used to be a criminal, I used to do this. So if I know the last four digits of your social security number, all right, which is not hard to get. I mean, we give up those last four pretty easily. So if I know the last four digits of your social security number, if I know the state you're born in and the year of your birth, guess what? It's pretty easy for me to get those first five digits. And from there, well, it's pretty easy for me to go ahead and victimize you and make a lot of cash. Very easy crime to commit. So the social security number in their, in, the social security administration in their infinite wisdom decided that they were going to randomize numbers. And they did. Like I said, every number issued after 2011, it's random. That crime stopped completely. Even if the criminal knows your last four, it doesn't matter if he's got your date of birth or he knows the state you're born in. He can no longer figure out the first five digits. So groovy, right? No, no, because you'll note I said in their infinite wisdom. Turns out that nobody really thought that shit through. So when the Social Security Administration started to randomize numbers, it opened up an entire new type of identity crime. It's called synthetic identity fraud. And it is prior to the pandemic. It was the fastest growing form of financial fraud on the planet, the fastest growing form of identity theft. 80% of all new account fraud was synthetic. It was, it, it, the losses were over $50 billion. It was 20% plus of every credit card chargeback. It was over 5% of all credit card, overall credit card debt. I mean, it was, man, it was a beast. I mean, a beast. Criminals out there, they were, I mean, it was on YouTube. It's still on YouTube. It's on Facebook. It's on the dark web. It's on Telegram. I mean, it's still bang, 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 bang. Now, that being said, the pandemic, because the federal government was very good about wanting to give every criminal that wanted money money, the pandemic kind of put the brakes on synthetic for a bit. It did because the federal government, you know, they instituted these stimulus programs and any fraudster who wanted to make a lot of money did. I like to refer to myself as the only fraudster that went broke during the pandemic because I am. Make no mistake, I am. Every other fraudster out there, they're driving their Maseratis. That's right, Maserati, the Yugo of supercars. They're driving their Maseratis. They're having fun time. They're making a lot of money. They made a lot of money. And synthetics at that point, the, the, the generation of synthetic profiles kind of took a brief hiatus. It didn't stop. Oh, no, it did not stop. Because remember, those three necessities of cybercrime that I talk about all the time, and we will do a show in the next week or so about the three necessities of cybercrime. But just to recap, those three necessities, gathering the data, committing the crime, cashing out. All three necessities have to work in conjunction. If they don't, the crime fails. The problem with that is that one single criminal, one guy, can't do all three things. He can do one thing. Sometimes he can do two. Very rarely can he do all three. And that is why you have the dark web, why you have Telegram, why you have the dark web, the service web groups, the marketplaces, everything else. They allow that one specific criminal to network with other criminals who are good in areas where he and sometimes she is not. So that's the three necessities of cybercrime. All right. Now, why that's important with the pandemic is that cashing out aspect. You see, if you can't put cash in pocket at the end of the day, your ass is useless. The crime is, you know, why even worry about committing the crime if you can't actually put cash in pocket, right? And it's, it's more than just, ah, it's more than just stealing money. Any idiot can have a couple of million dollars sent to a bank account. You got to be able to get that money out of the bank account and get cash in your pocket. Just because you steal $2 million does not mean that you have profited $2 million. Remember that. That's important. So this, with this pandemic, guess what? So you're, you're, you're stealing people's information. All right. So what's required to commit fraud against that? And I'll get back to synth synthetic, but this ties in with that. So the pandemic, 
everyone's information is available, all right? Absolutely. The commission, so that's gathering the data. There are really no tools required except for a payment instrument. So bank account, uh, prepaid debit card, FinTech services. The favorite words of any cyber criminal out there, Fin and tech. They love it. They love it. So, you, so for stimulus fraud, you were, you were using bank accounts, prepaid debit cards, FinTech services. By and large, that went toward FinTech services and prepaid cards because the KYC on both of those that know your customer laws and rules, they're rather lax <laughs> in both of those areas. So, you know, you're committing the crime. You've got the data. You've got the tools that you need. The commission of the crime itself, well, the government literally and the state unemployment offices literally had no security. And I mean, no security in place for over six months. Not only did they have no security in place, but the security that was in place, the CARES Act actually took some of that away. So it was wide open for fraudsters to come in and profit. And they did, they did, except for Brett. Like I said, I'm the only one that went broke during the pandemic. I'm kind of proud of that. So you hear me say that many times during my show, I'm the only fraudster who went broke during the pandemic. But it's true, guys. It was. It was uh, the pandemic started. I was uh, I was actually in Seattle when they had what was supposedly patient zero. I had just got over being, now this was February before the pandemic started. I was in Seattle recording a uh, commercial for T-Mobile, which aired about a year later because the pandemic put everything on stall. But um I was there when patient zero was there. I had, I had been horribly sick and I had just gotten over that. And I personally believe I had had COVID at that point, because it turns out now that COVID, they're saying COVID was in the United States, at least in November, if not before of the year prior. So I had, uh, I just gotten back and you could, you could see the writing on the wall. You know, there, some of these conferences, concerts had started to be canceled. Some of the conferences had started to be canceled. And I knew that uh, every cybersecurity conference was going to be canceled. Well, I made, you know, prior to me being listed as uh, chief criminal officer of Arcos Labs, outstanding company, by the way, prior to me being listed as uh, CCO at Arcos Labs, the way that I made my money was through consulting gigs and speaking engagements. Well, they were canceling all the conferences. All the speaking gigs were being canceled. And I knew that all those consulting gigs were going to dry up as well. So I, I came home and, you know, I saw that writing on the wall. I called the family into the kitchen. We had a round table. And the round table was basically Brett Johnson talking. And what I said was, is I said, hey, the way this story ends is with Brett Johnson back committing crime and in prison for 20 years. And, um, a funny thing happened. What happened was, is uh, I told that to every single person that would listen. You know, I told it to my family. I told it to my friends, my associates. I told it to my FBI contacts. FBI would call me about once every three weeks. Hey, Brett, uh, everything go all right over there, buddy? Uh, yeah, you doing okay? Hey, uh, let's have lunch today. Let's make sure you're all right. So I, I you know, I had these conversations and uh, everybody kind of took me under their wing. They looked out for me. They uh, would touch base with me, make sure everything was going all right. We had our, every single one of our payments delayed, you know, our mortgage, our car payments, everything else. We had all that delayed. And uh, I got a, a couple of legal PPP loans. I got on unemployment as well. And we made it through it. I went completely broke, credit rating, credit score, man. It took a nosedive. It took a nosedive. I had, I had built up my credit to a very respectable level. You know, I used to not have to worry about credit scores because I would steal your cards, not use any cards that I had. So I didn't have to worry about a credit score. But, you know, on this legal side, I, I had, you know, I have to worry about credit. And I had built up my credit score and the pandemic completely wrecked that. So now we're coming out of that. And uh, business is coming back with a vengeance. You know, I've been raising hell about some companies. I've been named CCO of, of Arcos Labs. I'm very thankful for the opportunities that I've been given and, and, more than that, I'm thankful for um, the way people reached out to me during the pandemic and um, kind of took me in under the wing again to make sure I was all right. And at the same time, I, uh, I didn't commit any crime. And I found out I was a hell of a lot stronger than what I thought I was. You know, I really thought I was going to go back to it. But it turns out I didn't. And I'm very, uh, I'm very proud of that, guys. I want you to know that I'm very proud of that. I don't... Uh, I try not to brag about much of anything. And uh, 
I want to brag about that because uh, it's important. It's important. I didn't know. I didn't know I had it in me, but I did. And I had a lot of people that looked after me again. And I just, just want to thank everybody that did that because there was a lot of people that listened to this show that, uh, that were there, you know, contacting me. You okay, Brett? You okay? Everything going all right. And it was just that affirmation, just the, um, you know, looking out for me that, that helped me get through that. So I'm very grateful for that. Now, that being said, we're talking about that cashing out aspect with synthetic fraud and the pandemic. So the problem was, is that, you know, you commit so much fraud, where do you have it deposited? So if you're committing, and it's those three necessities of cybercrime, remember, that's what we're talking about, gathering data, committing crime, cashing out. So the gathering data, all the data was there, all the tools that were needed was there. Committing the crime, very easy to commit the crime because there was no security in place. Cashing out, if you're cashing out, you got if you're doing stimulus fraud, you had to have a bank account, prepaid debit card, or fintech. If you did an unemployment fraud, it was prepaid debit card, fintech, because the KYC is <laughs> insane with some of those people, some of those companies. Um, what happens is, is depending on how you're setting up those accounts, you may not have the ability to set the account up using traditional identity theft methods, you know, stealing someone's PII, uh, making a fake uh, driver's license in that individual's name if you need to, blah, blah, blah. So the traditional methods sometimes don't work. So we saw some synthetic fraud start to pivot over into creating, strictly creating bank accounts or signing on to fintech services or prepaid debit cards. You would use synthetic profiles simply as a laundering mechanism as a tool to help you open up the account so you could launder money through that, all right? So that's what we started to see some of the synthetics being used for. So back to synthetic fraud, all right? And bear in mind the 90% stat, bear in mind the three necessities, gathering, uh, gathering data, committing crime, cashing out as we talk, because if you remember this, you'll go far in this game. All right, so synthetic fraud. Social Security Administration randomizes the numbers, it opens up this brand new area of identity theft. Fraudsters come in, eat it alive. Now, the way this crime works, and it still kind of works the same way today that it did back in 2011 when it first started. You can do two things. You can either fabricate a social security number out of thin air, all right? Following the algorithm, you can fabricate that number out of thin air, or you can use a child's social security number. You can steal a child's social security number. Typically, the way that most people were doing that's changed to degree now, but the way most people were doing that is they would simply use a child's social security number. They wouldn't worry about fabricating or generating their own social and then trying to test that against the social security database to see if it was, it was issued and when it was issued and anything else. Instead, they would just use a child's social security number where the child was issued the social after 2011. Now, to give you an idea of how this market actually was driven, Prior to synthetic fraud really taking off, and it really started to take off about four years ago. So prior to that, you could buy children's information for about $2 on the dark web. And for that $2, you would get the kid's name, social, date of birth, ad, uh, not address, the name, social, date of birth, mother's maiden name, place of birth. That ran you about $2. Synthetic fraud took off to such a degree that today children's information sells for $25. So it's went from $2 to $25 for the exact same information. So today $25 will buy you the child's name, social, date of birth, mother's maiden, place of birth. The only thing you need is the social. You can put any name you want to, to it because the numbers are randomized. You, so what happens is a criminal buys a, children's, a child's information. He just pulls the social out. He adds a name to it. He adds an adult date of birth, an address, a phone number. He applies for credit. Now, credit bureaus don't know you exist until you tell them you exist. If they've never seen that information before in their system, what happens for it is that application for credit is denied. But when it's denied, because that data has never been entered into the credit bureau before, when it's denied, it actually creates or generates a credit report in that synthetic profile's name and data. Ah, so information has never been seen in the credit bureau. It's submitted. 
because it's brand new data, no credit history, or anything else, the application for credit is denied, but that information is then logged and a brand new credit report is generated with that information, that data. So the ghost is now in the system, that synthetic profile, that synthetic person is now in the credit bureau system. Now, you want it in all three credit bureaus. And there's a way to do that. The way you typically do that is you, fi you find a place that, and you file, uh, you, you, you submit an application for credit with some group or some site that pings all three credit bureaus. See, a lot of the times when you're applying for a loan, it doesn't ping or pull credit reports from all three credit bureaus. It only does it from one. So you need to find some sort of creditor that will ping all three credit bureaus. So you're looking at, you know, road loans, you know, car loans, something like that, that typically does something like that. And when it pings all three, it builds those credit reports in all three credit bureaus. You can do it where it just pulls the credit or tries to pull the credit from one and it will, uh, it will later on proliferate across, across all three credit bureaus. But the quick way is to find some place where that pings all three and it builds the credit profile on all three credit bureaus at the same time. All right, now, now once you're there, the idea is to pump up the credit score quickly and then cash out, pocket the money. How do you do that? Well, understand that a, an application for credit, when, when a creditor runs your, tries to pull the credit report, it's not just pulling the credit report. They're actually looking for any type of open source intelligence that may be out there, which associates the name with the address, blah, blah, blah. So how does a criminal game OSINT, open source intelligence? Well, typically you go to a site like, you start by going to a site like listyourself.net. That's a free white pages listing service. You input that synthetic information in there, the name, the address, the phone number. Now, what happens is, is that makes sure that a couple of weeks later, any type of internet scrapers that are out there, they scrape that data. They start to see that name, that synthetic name associated with that address and that phone number. At the same time, the criminal can apply for rewards cards, grocery, airline, pharmacy. He can build a Facebook page, pretty good idea. LinkedIn page, even better idea and get his name associated, get his name and, and information online, all right? Because now we see a lot of people are trying to pull OSIN. A lot of security companies are saying, well, you know, the way to, the way to look for synthetic profiles, check and see if they've got a LinkedIn page. Do they have a Facebook page? Well, everybody's got a Facebook page. So criminals have been doing this stuff for years. They, they, they started out doing that because what you see, <laughs> here's, here's, a, here's a fun fact. When new crimes begin, when criminals actually start a brand new technique, they go overboard. They go through the roof, making sure that every base is covered. So initially when synthetic fraud started, they, they were covering through the roof this idea of OSINT. They were going out and building the Facebook page, the LinkedIn page. They were doing the white pages listing. They were doing the rewards points, everything else. Well, what, what happens is, is that's what starts with the crime. You cover all bases. When the crime first starts being implemented, you cover every single base you can, because you don't know what security is actually, what, what data is actually being looked at by the security companies. Once the crime is successful, over time, the criminal starts to experiment. What can I take away? And the profile or the crime is still successful. So what they found out was, is that while they began by creating LinkedIn pages, Facebook pages, doing all these other things for OSINT, they found out that, hey, Security companies aren't really looking at OSINT except for, you know, I need to do the white pages listing service. Sometimes I need to do, depending on how far I'm going to take the uh, synthetic profile, I need to do the rewards points. And that's typically what they, what they concentrated on. Well, now that synthetic is much more popular, security companies are like, oh yeah, you know, we need to look at the LinkedIn. We need to look at the Facebook. That's the way you catch these guys. Well, criminals started out doing that. And it's been very easy for them to go back doing that because they know how to do that. It's not rocket science. Remember, 90% of every single attack uses known exploits. This is not new. This is not new. So you take care of OSINT, all right? That way, any type of uh, crawlers that are out there, anybody that's looking for data outside of the credit report, the data is there. 
Next thing you do is the idea, again, is to pump up the credit score. How do you pump up the credit score? Well, you can do it traditionally the same way that you and I do it. You can start to build actual legitimate credit for that synthetic. It's called primary trade lines. You go out and you get that secured credit card, use the secured credit card enough until it becomes an unsecured credit card or you're, you're, uh, uh, you receive some offers for unsecured credit cards at you know, high interest rates, things like that. And you build the credit as any legitimate person would using primary trade lines. You see, there are two types of trade lines, two types of ways that credit is built for an individual in the United States. And that's primary and secondary trade lines. Primary trade lines are credit accounts that the individual has gotten him or herself and builds those things up traditionally. Now, that being said, there, there are credit repair companies out there that offer, there are some services that offer primary trade lines. You can find uh, rent reporting services that report to credit bureaus. You can find some of these other uh, services online that are somewhat unscrupulous that will report as a primary trade line to your credit report. Now, legitimate people do that all the time. Fraudsters and synthetic fraudsters especially are very good about employing those types of services. The historic way or the easiest way to pump up the credit in a very fast way is to use a, use a secondary trade line. Now, a secondary trade line. In the United States, <clears throat> let me get a drink here. In the United States, we have this thing called credit piggybacking, all right? And here's the way it works. I come, let's say, I, let's just use Brett as an example. I get out of prison. I get out of prison. I ain't got no credit. I ain't got no gas. I ain't got nothing. But I know you. I know you, and I know you got a nice credit card on you. So I'm going to come to you. I'm going to say, hey, man, or hey there, hey there, lady. Why don't you add me on? as an authorized user of your credit card. And you're going to go, whoa, what? Why would I do that? And I'll say, whoa, 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 whoa. First of all, it's not like I get access to your card. I don't. I don't get access to your card. I'm just on there as an authorized user. It doesn't mess with your credit score whatsoever. I'm simply an authorized user. And you'll look at me and you'll say, Brady, you do look trustworthy. I think I will do that. So you add me on as an authorized user of your one specific credit card. Now, the next reporting cycle of that credit card, that card, that specific card's history, then becomes my credit history. Just that one specific card, all right? That, that entire card's history then becomes my credit history. If the available balance is high enough, if the debt ratio is good enough, if the card has been alive, has been active long enough, guess what? A synthetic fraudster can do something like that, add two credit cards to a synthetic profile's credit report and shoot from a, you know, a 560, you know, whatever the beginning credit score is for individuals or sometimes no credit score at all. He can shoot from a very low or non-existent credit score up to a 760 plus in 45 to 60 days. Oh, oh, that's effective. And let me just segue here. Credit piggybacking, legal in the United States, can actually be a very good thing for those attempting to build or rebuild their credit. All right. And it's, it's a good thing for kids as well. If you've got children at the house and you want your child to make sure that, you know, when they get a start into adulthood, that they get a good start with good credit, they don't have to struggle. What you can do is you can add those children on as authorized users of your cards. They don't get access to the cards. It doesn't mess with your credit score whatsoever, but it really helps with their credit score. So they begin life with a good credit score, which is important in today's society. So it can be a good thing, but it's even, it's, it's an even better thing for criminals. All right. Well, there are tons of credit repair agencies out there that sell access to secondary trade lines. They go out and they'll find individuals that are willing to put someone else on their credit account just as an authorized user, and they get paid for that. So credit, a lot of credit repair companies offer that, or a criminal, even better, a criminal because everyone's information is available, a criminal can buy a credit card login. Now, now, see, if I went through a credit repair agency and tried to buy access to a secondary trade line or tried to buy a secondary trade line, sometimes that costs two to $4,000. Why would I want to spend that kind of money? See, here's another lesson for you. Cyber criminals are a frugal lot. 
we, I say we because I used to be in that, we do not like spending a lot of money because a lot of the times cybercrime is basically an, a, an attitude of, hey, I'm going to throw a bunch of shit up against the wall and I'm going to see what sticks. Well, if, a, if the bunch of shit you're throwing up against the wall costs a lot of money, most of that shit that's up against the wall doesn't stay. So most of it fails or falls off. If you're spending a lot of money for that, you're going to go broke pretty quickly. So cyber criminals are a frugal lot. So typically what you can do for a criminal, a crook, because everyone's information is available, credit card logins run you, I don't know, 20 bucks sometimes. You can get them for cheaper than that if you want to. So credit card login is going to run you 20 bucks. You buy the login. You simply log in and add that synthetic or many synthetics names to someone's credit card. And guess what? Finding out where that authorized user is for a legitimate person, it's not easy to find where you add a, a, a secondary user, an authorized user on it. So you can, a criminal can oftentimes get access to your credit, uh, credit card account, log in, add an authorized user, and you don't know that he's done that. Even if you log in and check your account, you still don't know that he's done that. So, and if you do know that he's done that, guess what? Well, what happens is I, if I were to buy your credit card login, add an authorized user on there, and you find out about it next week, too late, because it still helps that synthetic profile's credit report. It's already been submitted by that point. It's already through the system, and it's still going to help the credit score of that synthetic profile. So there's not really much ways that you can stop that. So that's the way that you build credit up, the credit score on the synthetic side. All right. Now, you, we've taken care of OSINT. We've taken care of building up the credit score. Once that's done, what do you do? Well, it depends. It's time to profit. It depends on the skill level of that specific criminal. Are you somebody that really doesn't know a damn thing in the world about cybercrime? Well, even that guy can profit. He can go down to the ATV center. He can go down and get himself a car. He can go down and get furniture. He sometimes hits some of these credit bureaus or credit, uh, uh, what's the small, it's not a bank. It's a, um, I'll remember it at some point. It's not the bank, it's the credit. Bah. You can go down and get a personal loan from some of these people for about $20,000. And that was happening. That was happening. It was very easy to do. That was for the people who weren't, weren't really skilled in using synthetic profiles. Or if you're a more experienced identity thief, you know that, hey, I've got this, this profile. I can go ahead and apply for credit at many different places, get all the cards in, make payments on that. And instead of profiting $20,000, I can profit, you know, fifty dollars to $70,000. Or better yet, for a really skilled individual, I can use that synthetic. So what I would do, you'll love this. What I would do is I would buy a child's social security number, all right? I would steal your information. Yeah, somebody out there listening, I would steal your information because everyone's information is available. You got to remember that everyone's information is available. I would, uh, I would, you, I would buy the child's social security number. At the same time, I would steal your information. I'm just, I'm going to steal your social, your date of birth, and I'm going to have your name. All right. Now, the only thing I'm going to use your information for is to apply for an EIN, an employer identification number, because I cannot do that with a synthetic profile. So I'm going to do that with your information in your name. Just get the EIN. At the same time, I'm going to steal a child's social security number. I'm, I'm going to put your name on that child's social security number. I'm going to put your date of birth on that child's social security number. Then I'm going to at an address, at a phone number. I'm going to build that child's social security number up credit-wise to that 760 plus that I had talked about, all right, in your name. Now, once I've got that synthetic profile in your name, 760 plus credit score, I've got the EIN using your legitimate information. I'm going to mix them both together. I'm going to apply for business credit with a synthetic social and everything, but with your EIN number that I got using your real information. I'm going to mix them both together. I'm going to apply for business credit. Now, why would I do that? Well, an application for business credit typically comes with credit lines, you know, two, three hundred thousand dollars And I can get a few for those from a few places. So it depends on where or the, the, the experience level of a criminal as to how much profit and how you're going to exploit that synthetic profile. Now, that was historically the way this thing was done. Now, banks, creditors, they were and are being eaten alive, but at least they developed the tools that they needed to start to 
track it, identify it, and fight it because they, they got eaten alive with it so much, it was targeting them specifically. They started to understand how to identify this thing, all right, and, and they, they started to have some real success. Now, criminals, at the same time, they started to develop brand new techniques to do this kind of stuff and everything else, but that's historically the way that's done, and they started to look at different verticals or different ways that you could use synthetic profiles. And one of those ways was, as I mentioned earlier, with the pandemic, it was ways, it was using that synthetic profile strictly as a laundering mechanism, using the synthetic profile to just open up a bank account and then launder the money through that bank account. All right. So that's, that was typically it. Instead of using that synthetic to you know, get credit someplace else and then defraud the creditor, they would stop with using the synthetic just to be able to launder money. Kind of a new technique, not really, but kind of a new way to do things. A new way of looking at things is a better way to put it. Again, that statistic we mentioned at the beginning of the show, 90% of every single attack uses a known exploit. A known one. It's not the stuff we don't know about. It's the stuff we do know about that we've not done anything about that tends to be the issue. That's with cybersecurity. It's with cybercrime. That's the way this thing works. Now, we've set the stage with synthetic fraud. Let's, pa let's pause there. We're going to keep synthetic fraud in, in our heads. All right. We're going to keep it in our heads because we're coming back to that. And let's talk about refund fraud. Again, Brady has been warning about refund fraud. Four years, four years, the very first keynote presentation that I gave at the CNP conference walked through the history of refund fraud and warned the merchants in attendance, the security companies in attendance, and the consultants in attendance that, hey, this thing is going to eat you guys alive. Guess what? It failed. Those warnings fell upon deaf ears. No one really paid any attention to that in the audience or the security companies or the consultants. No one really paid any attention to that whatsoever. So fast forward to the past two years, guess what? Refund fraud is eating those merchants alive. I am not an I told you so kind of guy, but I mean, but let's, let's be honest now. Come on, let's, let's, let's think about it for a second. All right, so refund fraud. Just to recap, starts with Amazon on Evolution Marketplace. It was going on before that, yes, but really as an organized type of crime, it starts with Amazon over on Evolution Marketplace. Evolution was a dark net market back, geez, 2013, 2014, the, the owner of that. And here's a, here's a lesson about dark net marketplaces. Dark net marketplaces always start out as an exit scam. The person who, who actually, the criminal who starts to opens up the market, his idea at the end of the day is to shut down the market and steal everyone's Bitcoin and walk away a millionaire. The only thing that stops a marketplace from doing that is law enforcement comes in and busts everybody and gives that guy life in prison. Just ask Ross Ulbrich if you don't think that's what happens, because that's exactly what happens. Ross, Silk Road inventor, ends up with not one, but two life sentences. He's still got life. He's going to have life tomorrow. He'll have life next week. He'll die in prison under that life sentence. That's what happens. So all marketplaces start as an exit scam. Evolution market, no different. <clears throat> the owner of Evolution Market... He exit scams. He steals $24 million worth of Bitcoin. Back then, back then it was $24 million. Today, that would be several billion dollars that this guy stole. No one know who, knew who did it. That one, it was the guy, the people who ran Evolution Marketplace was a guy and a girl. No one knew who it was. A year later, they find the guy on a beach in Cyprus. He didn't have his head or his hands. And word came from the people in the know that the owner of this guy had ripped off some Ukrainians when he decided to exit scam. Some people in the Ukrainian mob he had stolen money from. They took exception to that. That, of course, left the message of do not steal. Do never steal. You should never. You can steal whatever you want to steal. Steal whatever from whoever, but don't you ever. Don't you ever steal from us. If you steal from us, we're coming for your head. Yes, we're coming for your head. We're going to mount it on the wall. 
We're going to mount your head on the wall. Yeah. See, I'm, I'm doing kind of a cartel Ukrainian type guy accent there because it just does that sometimes. But that's what happened. So refund fraud starts on Evolution Marketplace. And what happened is we started to see some guys because I was not a legal guy at that point. I was that pivot guy. I didn't know which, where my history, where my future was going to go or anything else like that. So I was on these marketplaces. So we started to see on Evolution Marketplace, people would come in and they would say, hey, I'm, I'm making $10,000 a month doing Amazon refunds. And the response was, you, sir, are full of shit. No one makes $10,000 a month doing Amazon refunds. Well, turns out they were not full of shit. They were making $10,000 a month doing Amazon refunds. And the way that it worked back then is you would sign up for a prime free trial, two months. You would use your name, your credit card, your address. You would order, say, a MacBook Pro. Amazon would ship it out to you. It would arrive two days later. Amazon would leave it on your front porch. You'd get on a chat session or on the phone call. And you, on the phone, you say, hey, uh, yeah, I didn't, um, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I know it says it was delivered, but uh, I didn't get this, uh, this laptop. It's not there. So Amazon would send out another. It would arrive two days later. They would leave it on your porch. You'd get back on the phone, back on a chat session. Yeah, you get, guess what? <laughs> ah, I didn't get that one either. And they would give you a refund. So you would end up with two MacBook Pros and your money back. And it was not just laptops. People were doing it with 70-inch televisions. They were doing it with living room sofas. Yeah, that, uh, <laughs> that living room sofa, man. I, uh, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. And they would send you another sofa app. It ate Amazon alive. I mean, absolutely alive. There were dedicated forums strictly for that. Thousands of people were talking about it on these forums. We had little cottage industries pop up of professional refunders. If you were not capable or comp confident enough to contact Amazon yourself, these individuals for 7 to 10% of the order total would contact Amazon for you and guarantee that they would get your money back or the replacement item back for you. So it ate Amazon alive. It actually redefined the way modern cybercrime operates. And there's very few things that do that. Shadow Crew did it. Uh, cryptocurrency did it. The Tor browser did it. Refund uh, fraud did it. The pandemic did it. There's very few things in the history of cybercrime that really redefines cybercrime. And refunding is one of that because what happened, what happens is, is before refunding, a beginning cyber criminal, he would typically go out and he would start his aspiring, his career as a new cyber criminal, as an aspiring cyber criminal. He would start his career buying stolen credit card details. And then he would take those stolen credit card details and he would try to defraud Amazon or Apple or the Microsoft store for some expensive laptop. And he would fail miserably because he didn't know the proper way to commit credit card fraud. So some of those criminals that did that, some of those guys would throw their hands up in the air, they would walk away and they would give up on their hopes and dreams of becoming this cyber criminal. They would go out and get a real job or maybe they would get their asses in school, which is where a lot of these people need to be. So some of the guys, some of them would stick around and they would buckle down and they would start to learn the dynamics of how to successfully commit credit card fraud. And then over they, you know, they would start carting food or online services and things like that. And then they would finally reach the skill level where they could defraud those high dollar electronics. All right. That's the way cybercrime historically operated before refund fraud comes in. Nowadays, it's not like that. Nowadays, somebody reads an article online. Oh, look at what all, I'll tell you what, look at how much money these cyber criminals are making. They make it hand over fist, hand over fist money. They, they drive in those Maserati Yugo supercars. I need me a Yugo supercar. So these people, instead of buying credit cards, they go on and they start committing refund fraud and they start profiting immediately because it is a very easy, very profitable crime that doesn't really require any skill at all to commit and profit. So it redefines cybercrime. Now you've got all these aspiring criminals that start making money immediately, that which means that guess what? A lot of them are not 
retiring and getting their asses in school. They're sticking around because they're making a lot of money stealing from merchants. And then as they're making that money, they start to learn other types of crimes, which becomes very dangerous, right? Because think about it. Okay, let's put things into perspective. Shadow Crew. When I started Shadow Crew, I ran Shadow Crew. When Shadow Crew was shut down by the federal government, the law, the police, we ended with 4,000 members. Fast forward to 2017, Alpha Bay, July 5th is shut down by federal authorities. When it was shut down, it had 240,000 members, the largest criminal group on the planet at that point in time. Fast forward two more years, 2019, black market is shut down, 1.15 million members, million. Then the pandemic hits. Then refund fraud really starts to take hold. Do you think the numbers have shrank or grown? Yes, that's right. They've grown and they will continue to grow and explode because cybercrime is not rocket science. It's not complicated to commit a lot of these crimes. And refunding fraud is the easiest fraud that you can possibly hope to commit. It's guaranteed profit. All right. So it eats Amazon alive. And Amazon, here's another lesson for you. Amazon doesn't tell anybody. Now, the criminals all know about it. Absolutely. All the criminals know about it. Amazon knows about it. But Amazon doesn't share any of that information with any other potential victims. So nobody else really pays any attention to it. Nobody knows about it. Brett Johnson gets up there and complains about it. And for CNP and everything, falls on deaf ears. You know, I talk about Amazon and people are like, oh, it's just happening to Amazon. It'll never hit us. Yes, I know he said it, but we've not seen anything like that. It's not going to happen. We're okay. <laughs> Oh, you're not okay. It's eating you alive today. And oh yeah, you're worried about it today. Should have listened long ago. Again, I am not, I am not. Oops. I accidentally pressed the button. It's he's coming after you. That's right. So yeah, if you listen long ago, it's that it's that idea. You gotta listen. You gotta listen to the to the professionals that are out there that actually know what they're talking about. But you gotta know who who actually knows what the hell they're talking about. We're hiring all these consultants. People are hiring all these consultants out there who claim to know what they're talking about, and they don't. And today's episode is an example of exactly that. So refund fraud eats merchants alive. Amazon lets it go on for months, months, until finally Amazon figures, well, I guess we need to do something about that. So what do they do? Their solution was to require these refunders to go and get a police report. They figured, hey, there's no fraudster in their right mind that's going to contact law enforcement and file a police report. So that'll shut down a lot of this refund fraud. All right. Good idea, right? Not, not really. I mean, it depends on how much profit you're, you're going to actually look at as to whether you're going to file that police report or not. But even worse than that, even worse than that, here's what goes on. So Amazon rep requires a, a police report to be filed with Amazon. Amazon, somebody, criminals are very good about testing everything. You got to realize that we are very good about testing everything. So someone within that criminal community, they, they read Amazon's new policy and they said to themselves, you know, I wonder, I wonder if Amazon's actually verifying those police reports. So he photoshopped one, he, a fake one. He sends it in to Amazon. Turns out Amazon was not verifying those police reports. He gets his refund. Well, what happens is, is that generates an entirely new cottage industry on criminal forums and marketplaces. All of a sudden, you've got all these little businesses that pop up, criminal businesses, offering Photoshop police reports for $25. And they proceed to eat Amazon alive again for another six months until Amazon starts to verify those police reports. All right. So that's what happens. Now, as Amazon continues to put in additional security measures, and I don't want you to think that Amazon has stopped this type of fraud because they've not. Amazon was the first place it actually hits. Today, it is still hitting Amazon. The only difference really is the dollar amounts have increased for which you can defraud Amazon. So yeah, yeah. Pay attention to that when you start talking to some of these consultants and security companies out there that say they can stop refund fraud. Pay attention because the same companies, the same merchants that were being hit with it years ago, they are still being hit with it today. So pay attention. 
We call that kind of talk, oh yeah, I can stop it, I can stop it. We call that cybersecurity pillow talk. That's simply what you need to hear in order to pay me. So pay attention, pay attention, it's important, it's important. Now, Amazon starts to implement other types of security. What happens? Well, much like I said in those presentations, fraudsters start to look at other targets. They look at Apple. Well, can we commit the same type of fraud at Apple? Yes, turns out you can. Same thing happens at Apple. Apple starts to implement security, then they pivot over to the Microsoft store. Apple never, never shares any information with any of their competitors or anything else, all right? Until it starts to bleed down to every single merchant, every size merchant on the planet. Today, refund fraud is really hitting every retailer and merchant that is around. And that's that's the way it is. That's pretty much the end of the story. The way the fraud is actually committed. There are three main techniques to commit this fraud. The first technique is to say, hey, much like I, much like those initial fraudsters did at Amazon, hey, I, I know you said it, but uh, <laughs> I didn't get it. I didn't get it. It's not here. It's not here. I mean, I, the tracking information shows it was delivered, but uh, the box ain't on my porch. Yeah, I didn't sign for that. So you claim it didn't arrive. And you hope for the best. Now, that is still a successful method, depending on which merchant a fraudster is trying to defraud. That method still works this many day, this many years later. And the reason it works is because, let's be honest, sometimes a merchant sends out an item, a shipment, and it don't get there. So, you know what? We're going to go ahead. We're going to send out another one. and We're going to give you a refund. All right. So that happens. The second method is to simply claim that, hey, you know, hey, uh, yeah, I, I got the box, man. Yeah, you sent the box, but <laughs> the, the item that I ordered ain't in the box. It ain't in there. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, the, the laptop box is there. The box is there. The, the laptop box is there. But there ain't no laptop in the box. So what are you guys going to do about that? Now, that method is far more successful. Far, far more successful. And I got to be honest with you, I've had that happen. I've actually walked into Best Buy before, purchased a video game or what have you, went out in the parking lot, opened it up or got home and opened it up, and it ain't there. That does not make for a happy bready. So that technique is actually fairly successful across the board. The nifty way, whoo. Ah, the nifty way, the third way it's being committed, is this thing that they call FTID, fake tracking identification. So fake tracking. So a fraudster can, can he buys that laptop from Apple or where have you. He buys that laptop. Then he contacts customer service and he says, you know, I don't want it. I don't want it. I don't need it anymore. I'm going to return it. And so Apple or whatever the merchant is, they say, okay, we're going to go ahead and send you a shipping label so you can return it to us. And the fraudster's like, I like it. I like it. Go ahead and send me that shipping label. So he gets the shipping label. Then he can manipulate the shipping label. He can manipulate the shipping label to make it appear that he has sent the item back for a refund. And the company will actually have it cataloged as, yes, we received that item back for a refund. And they give the refund. Meanwhile, the company has, the merchant has never received the item back. And there's a few ways to do that. This, this episode is not about that. It's about synthetic refund fraud. So I'm not going to go into the ways. Yes, I know them. I'm not going to go into the ways that you can manipulate that tracking label or that shipment to make it appear that the merchant has got it back. But there are a few very nifty ways that you can do that. And it is highly, it is highly effective. Now, we have laid the groundwork. We have explained what synthetic fraud is. We have talked about what refund fraud is. Now, much like a Reese's cup, we're going to mix them together. You got your chocolate in my peanut butter. You got your peanut butter on my chocolate. Mm. Ooh, that, that tastes good. I like it. Well, fraudsters like it too. You got your synthetic fraud on my refund. You got your refunds in my synthetic fraud. Ooh. Ooh, that's tasty. I like it. Well, I like it too. Well, I don't like it, but it's nifty. It's nifty. It's something to talk about. So what happens is over the past couple of years, we've had a merchants have been eaten alive with refund fraud. All right. Banks, creditors have been eaten alive with synthetics. Now merchants, here's, here's the deal. 
It's not that merchants have never heard by this point in time. It's not that merchants have ever, have never heard of synthetic fraud. They have, but they've never really had to worry about it. And the reason why is, is that the onus has been on the bank or the creditor. You know, they get the, the, the fraudster gets the card, then they use the card to get the laptop from the merchant. So, you know, the, the bank is the one that issues the, uh, issues the credit and everything else. Now, there have been some cases. Ha! There have been some cases of an unscrupulous bank. Once they find out it's synthetic, that they try to lay the blame on the merchant, claiming that it's simply traditional identity theft, not synthetic fraud. And guess what? You owe us for those losses without sharing with the merchant that it was synthetic fraud. One of those banks, I ended up calling an asshole on stage a couple years ago, pre-pandemic. I called them an asshole. They were in the audience and I got in trouble for that. Yes, I got in trouble. We were doing the, uh, the online fraudcast at that point in time. As a result of that, Ultimately, the online broadcast ends because there was a difference of opinion. One of us was an asshole, and it may have been me. Yes, it may have been me. So the broadcast ended, and it turns out that I that that, that specific conference. I mean, it may be because of the pandemic, but they even though I told the truth, even though I was looking out for their 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 clients there when I said it. Well, it turns out that that bank likes to give some money to that conference every now and then. So I'm not. I may be invited back, may not. But again, I am that guy that's going to say what needs to be said. You can bet your bottom dollar on that. So merchants, back, to, back on topic, merchants have never really had to worry about identifying a lot of synthetic fraud because the onus, the, the financial loss has typically been on the side of the bank or the creditor. All right, now, Bear that in mind because this is important. Now, let's go back to that third way that fraudsters are profiting with synthetic fraud, faking the tracking information. So they make it appear that the item has been sent back, the company issues the refund. Now, what's happened because merchants were being eaten alive on that, we've had an entire little industry of consultants that have popped up that are trying to make their living saying that, oh yeah, yeah, I know all about sin. I know all about refund fraud. I know all about it. Yeah, I know everything. I know everything there is to know about it. And I know how to stop it. Yes, only me. I can stop it. Sign up for my program. Sign up for my site. Listen to me all day long. Pay me a lot of money. I am the expert on this and I got you. So they have been talking about it. And as I said earlier in this episode, it is important. It is important to realize that if you are designing your security based on threat intel, it's important to have complete threat intel. All right. You don't need to be relying on somebody that's simply getting their information from Google, mimicking some of the stuff Brett Johnson is saying without a complete understanding of what Brett Johnson is talking about, or relying strictly on the information that's shared by criminals on publicly available criminal channels. Now, I'll grant you, there is a boatload of information that is shared on public criminal channels, a boatload. You can, you can get a lot of threat intel from that. Can you get anywhere near complete threat intel? No, 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 you cannot. But if someone is telling you, oh yeah, we got you, we got you, is all you need to know. They are you doing you a huge disservice. So bear that in mind. If you have been working with any consultant, any security company, and they have not mentioned what we're about to talk about, you have not had complete threat intel. You have not had a full picture of the problem. And that, my friends, has resulted in you continuing to be victimized because believe you me, this, this is a very effective way to defeat those countermeasures that you've been working on based on what some of these consultants have been telling you. Now, the reason I say that, Let's go back to that third method of how fraudsters commit refund fraud, that fake tracking information. You, you manipulate the shipping label to make it appear that you've sent that product back for refund. The merchant grants the refund without the merchant really ever receiving the product, or maybe the merchant gets the wrong product back or any number of things like that. All right. 
Now, consultants, a lot of security companies started to talk about that because that information was shared on publicly available criminal channels. And I talked about it as well. All right. And I shared that and they picked up on that. Now, as a result, some of these merchants started to pay attention to those returns. All right. Uh, oddly enough, and you'll love this one. Oddly enough, there's a lot of merchants out there that don't keep track of online fraud losses. Yeah. There's even more merchants out there that don't keep track of losses due to refunds. Yeah. Guess what? There's even more out there that their fraud departments for some of these merchants refuse to consider refunding as fraud. They don't want to count it as a fraud number because, let's be honest, it would destroy their fraud numbers. So they are like, oh, no, no, it's not, it's not, uh, yeah, it's, it's, not a, it's not a fraud problem. It's not a fraud problem. It's, it's a customer service problem. That's the issue. So it's, uh, you know, it's customer service. So uh, you're going to talk about it. We're not going to consider it fraud because it's not fraud. It's customer service. <laughs> so because a lot of these consultants have been talking about this, some of these merchants have started to verify the returns. You know, they, they'll give the refund out to the fraudster, but then they contact, they're like, hey, yeah, down there, down there, down there receiving, down there at our return center. Hey, could you check to make sure that there's something that we got a box first to buy? Second of all, that the correct product is in the box. Can you check to make sure of that? So they check to make sure, and it turns out that, well, we didn't really get anything. Somebody put, uh, somebody put a return label on a magazine and sent it in. Or, you know, we tracked down the shipment and yeah, it says it was delivered here, but it was actually delivered over to this other place and it got lost from there. Or, you know what, they, they put a button, they put some garbage in the box. That's what they did. Or they returned, instead of returning an optical drive, they returned a 25-year-old CD-ROM drive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they started to verify that these returns were legitimate that they actually got what they were supposed to get back at the return center or receiving, all right? The, the way they coped with that was the merchant would at that point rebill the payment instrument that was initially used. Ah, remember what I said, return, return fraud or refund fraud. It starts out typically the guy, the criminal, uses his name, his address, his card. He buys a product. All right. So merchants understood that. Consultants had told them that's the way the crime operates. So they try to rebuild the payment instrument. Well, the criminals, they catch on to that pretty quickly. So what happens? Well, they simply shut the account down. And I'm going to get, I'm going to, yeah, I use my Chase card. I defraud you for, well, ask Dell. Dell gets defrauded for, uh, I'm, <laughs> there's one guy that's bragging about hitting Dell for $17,000 worth of Alienware products. So I'm going to use my Chase card. I'm going to defraud Dell for $17,000. And then I'm going to shut down the account. Good luck rebuilding that. So that's the way they fought it. But guess what? At least if a criminal does shut down that account, at least the merchant knows who to come after, right? I mean, if they wanted to, and let's be honest, they, the very few of them ever pursue any criminal charges. But if they wanted to, they could pursue criminal charges. They could get collection agencies involved. They could hound the hell out of the person because at least they know who to go after. But what happens if there isn't someone to go after? Oh, yeah. What happens if you create a synthetic profile with the purpose of not defrauding a bank, not defrauding a creditor, but specifically defrauding a merchant. Ah, well, that, that's different. That's different. That puts, remember, merchants, a lot of merchants have heard of synthetic. They're familiar with it, but they've never had to worry about it. The onus has been on the bank, the financial institution, the creditor. But now the onus is on the merchant because the only thing the synthetic is being used for, remember I talked about the pandemic, that we saw that, that pivot where fraudsters started to use strictly the synthetic profiles to open up bank accounts to launder money. 
Again, 90% of every single attack uses known exploits. Ah, remember that. You'll go far in this game. So now you've got fraudsters who are using synthetic profiles strictly to open up a bank account, fund the bank account legitimately, and then use that to defraud a merchant. Synthetic refund fraud. Think about that for a second. So, so if you're... If I'm committing refund fraud, traditionally, I'm using my name. I'm not an identity thief. I'm using my name, all right? I go through, I open up several bank accounts, and I hit whatever merchants I can with those bank accounts. But guess what? At some point, I'm going to run out of names. I'm going to run out of bank accounts. So what do I do? Well, I pivot over to prepaid debit cards. Well, merchants have gotten very good about finally, you know, <laughs> here's a secret for those who may not be in the know. Visa don't like you to keep bin list. They don't want merchants to keep bin list. A bin list is the bank identification number. It is the first six digits of the credit or debit card. It tells the type of card that it is and the issuing bank. Visa doesn't want merchants to do that because they are afraid that merchants will say, well, this order is more likely to be fraud or this order is not. This is more important person. This person is not blah, 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 blah. Well, it turns out that criminals, they love to keep bin lists because a bin is very good. You can you know, A specific bin is better in, in, for committing fraud in certain geographic areas. It's better, you, one specific bin works better to defraud one merchant over another, blah, blah, blah. A bin will also tell you the, the likely available balance on a card, things like that. So from a criminal point of view, bin lists are extremely important. It's a tool that has been de denied merchants because Visa don't want you to do that. It's against the rules for you to keep a bin list. So I, I advise immediately for merchants to pay attention to bins. That way you know if it's a gift card. You know if it's a prepaid debit card. You know what kind of card it is that's being placed with the order. That becomes important in refund fraud because initially, again, the fraudster starts using his bank account, his credit card. All right, He mines all that out. So he's still, he's still wanting to commit the fraud. How does he do that? Well, he pivots over to prepaid debit cards, and then he goes over to gift cards, and then finally he runs out of this. He's he's in a he's scurrying to figure out okay how do I how do I set up accounts so maybe I use fintech services. Yeah, you can do that too, and they're doing that. Just ask Chime and a few other companies over there. All right, so how do I set up, how do I set this up? So he pivots. He's looking. He's always looking for new accounts in order to commit this type of fraud. That becomes one of the issues. Remember. Those three necessities of cybercrime that I talked about. Gathering data, committing the crime, cashing out. Cashing out. If you can't put cash in pocket, you're useless. So with, with refund fraud, if you don't have that account where you can pay out of, you are useless. You can't commit the fraud. Synthetic identity fraud solves that problem. Now, certainly, certainly a fraudster that was unaware of synthetic fraud. And we saw this, a fraudster that was unaware of synthetic fraud, he could commit traditional identity theft, use someone's stolen information to try to open up a bank account or a credit account or anything else. That becomes problematic though, because everybody's been knowing about traditional identity theft for a while. And it becomes very questionable if you're going to get by with simply even opening up that bank or credit account. All right. And if you're going to open up a credit account, why would you worry about refund fraud if you could just defraud a retailer for MacBook Pros out of the out of, out of the gate? We're talking about refund fraud, which is a guaranteed profit. So at some point, you need new accounts. Synthetic fraud solves that problem. It absolutely solves that problem. If you think about it, what does think about think about all the issues that synthetic fraud solves? from a fraudster point of view, from the criminal point of view. Okay, so it takes care of OSINT, all right? So the address is associated with the name that's placing the order, okay? So all of a sudden, that's taken care of. Any merchant that's out there that's that's trying to pull the address, and I've seen a few merchants that do that, any merchants that's trying to pull the address, synthetic fraud takes care of that. It handles that. It satisfies that. It satisfies any KBA, knowledge-based authentication, because in the United States, 
Everything's based on KBA, knowledge-based authentication, those security questions that are asked. What's your mother's maiden name? What cross street did you grow up on? Blah, 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 blah. KBA. It satisfies that on the criminal side because the criminal creates that identity. He has all of the knowledge-based answers that he needs to answer any security question. There's nothing that can be asked that he cannot answer because he is the creator of that person, that synthetic profile. It solves the device ID or browser fingerprinting issue. All right, so uh, traditional identity theft, you have an individual that has been online before. Perhaps the individual has already got an account at Amazon, Apple, or whatever, and his device ID has been cataloged, his browser fingerprint has been taken. Using a synthetic profile satisfies that on the criminal side because you're using a device out of the gate that's associated throughout with that synthetic identity. So it solves that. It, it really bypasses all traditional identity theft countermeasures. That's what a synthetic profile does. So here's what happens. You start, and they call it CPN for credit profile or credit privacy. No, that's what it's called on the criminal side, all right? So the way it starts is you create that synthetic identity. Now, you don't have to actually pop it up or bump it up all the way to where you're getting great credit. You're just pumping it up just enough to be able to open up the bank account, which does not take very long at all. You can do it in a matter of days. All right. So you build that synthetic identity, get it in the, get it to the point where you can open up a bank account, and then you legitimately fund that bank account. You're not funding it with stolen money. You're not trying to defraud the bank. You're simply funding that bank account with legitimate funds. All right. Then once that's done, you pick up the phone or you get online and you place an order with an online merchant and you order several thousand dollars worth of product. Now, product shipped out, you do the FTID, the fake tracking manipulation, and you claim it, you know, whatever you want to claim to get the refund. The refund is in given to the fraudster. The fraudster goes back to the bank account, immediately shuts the bank account down and gets his money out. The merchant later on discovers that, hey, fraud was committed. We need to rebuild this. They go to rebuild the payment instrument that it was initially used, the instrument on file. They cannot because the account is shut down. Now, here's, an idea. here's, here's one of the points. We're, when I say that this is being used for thousands of dollars, I mean one instance, a retailer merchant was hit for actually two instances, one $118,000 in furniture. The other one, $130,000 in electronics, $130,000. Now, the issue is, is that, you know, a refund fraudster, he hits a merchant for $1,000. Probably that merchant ain't going to come after you. He hits a merchant for $130,000. Somebody somewhere is going to ask some questions. So both in both these instances, synthetic profiles were used to open up the bank account and then defraud the merchant. Bank account is then shut down. Merchant in both instances tries to rebuild the payment instrument, finds out the account is closed, and then the investigation really ramps up at that point. We're coming after you. Now, certainly, I don't know if the, any one of these merchants pursued criminal charges, but I do know that when they started to try to track down the individuals, there's no one to track down because it's synthetic. To top it off, the merchant never knows it's synthetic because as far as they're concerned, this is a real person. So they're always looking for this real individual who defrauded them for over $100,000 on one order. One order. That's the importance of synthetic refund fraud. That is what's eating merchants alive. The problem, again is that merchants have not have not really had to worry about synthetics on their side. They have historically only had to worry about it in, in the aspect that a fraudster was getting a credit card and then visiting their site and using that stolen credit card to purchase product. All right, that's really, the, so they've never, never really had to worry about that. Now it's changed. Now this crime, is this crime popular? It's a hell of a lot more popular than you think it is. It is being widely discussed and shared on private criminal channels on Telegram. 
Absolutely it is. Absolutely it is. We're seeing CPN marketplaces open up with the express idea of these CPNs. And when I say CPN, that's the credit privacy, credit profile number. That's that's what a lot of fraudsters call synthetic fraud. You don't see, ha, you don't see a lot of fraudsters say, oh, I'm going out and I'm creating a synthetic profile to commit fraud. Now you're saying, you're, you hear them say, oh, yeah, I'm getting a CPN. Yeah, I got a CPN. Anybody got CPNs available? How do I make a CPN? Because that's the tool. That's the actual aspect of synthetic fraud that's important to a fraudster, that profile. So we're seeing a lot of marketplaces pop up as well. This is a fraud that is only going to grow. All right. Now, you've, you've got a lot of the, the initial refund fraudsters that they still use their name. They still use their card, their address because they're unskilled. They don't know this game. They don't know the dynamics of proper cybercrime. But again, because they're profiting immediately on this type of crime, it allows them to sit back with their profit in hand and learn how to properly commit this crime as well as other crimes. So we're going to continue to see synthetic refund fraud pump up. All right. Now, how do you fight that? Ah, ha, ha. Remember what I told you. And I've spoke on this before. Are you going to stop? refund fraud? The answer, Virginia, is no. No, you're not. Any company, any consultant out there that tells you, hey, you know, man, yeah, man, we got it. We can stop it. We got this. They are lying to you. The best thing that you can do is run quickly for the door. They cannot stop it. The companies that were initially hit with this are still being hit with this fraud today. The only difference is the dollar amounts for which they can be defrauded have increased. They are still being hit with it. So do not feed me that line of shit saying that you can stop this crime. You can't. You cannot. Can you mitigate it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely you can. Absolutely you can mitigate that type of fraud. So how do you mitigate that fraud? We'll talk about that when we come back. This is the Brett Johnson Show. Okay, so now we are back from that little interlude because I had been talking for a while. I needed to get a cough drop, take a drink, all that good stuff. The question, ah, the question was, can it be stopped? Well, we answered that, no. No, it can't. Anyone that tells you it can, run, run quickly for the door. The next question, can it be mitigated? Why, yes, Virginia, it can. See, I'm not all gloom and doom. Brett Johnson, ray of sunshine. I'm hope personified. First, let's be honest. In order to fix a problem, first, you have to admit you have a problem. That's the first step of recovery. Yes, I have an issue. Don't think you do. Well, you do. Believe me, you do. You don't want to be, hey, you don't want to be one of those companies in denial. You know, the ones I'm talking about, they're the ones that say, well, you know, it's not an organized crime problem. It's not organized. It's solo people. It's solo. They're just, you know, as someone who's just taking advantage of the system. Now, I'll grant you, you got those people out there. But if you think it's not organized against you, you are wrong. It is. Next thing, don't be one of those companies that, that you don't keep track of your fraud losses, all right? Maybe you're one of these companies that, that you don't keep track of your online overall online fraud losses. What the hell are you doing? Honestly, what are you doing? So don't be like that. Don't call it a customer service issue and, call it a fraud is and refuse to call it a fraud issue because you're afraid the numbers are going to destroy your overall fraud numbers. They will. Promise you, they will. It's that bad of a problem. Next thing is don't blame it. Do not blame the problem on the shippers. Do not blame the problem on the outside partnerships. Take, take some responsibility. All right. Now, yes, it may be because I'm aware of some insiders that are over at UPS. I'm aware of that third-party sourcing system where you can use a um, an outside payment company, fintech company, to, uh, to pay for some of these products that the merchants have. Yes, that's a problem. It is. But you have to 
worry about your specific organization, your business. All right. You can't just blame, oh, you know, it ain't my problem. It ain't my problem. They they use it as this, this fintech company. They use in their card or service, which we just happen to accept. And they're defrauding us like that. Well, you know what? You still have to accept some responsibility here. You have to implement what security you can on your side. So how do you do that? Well, you start by using, by looking at data, data. You need your data to inform policies and procedures. All right. So understand that, that that's, you've got to have a clear picture of the data, which brings us back to the topic at hand. Is your threat intel good? I can't stress that enough. Is your threat intel good? If you've spoken to any, and I mean any, security company or consultant, if you've got one of these people on payroll and you've been paying them and they have not been talking or mentioned to you, the synthetic use in refunding, you have poor intel, which means that you have poor data, which means that you're designing partial security. You're designing security based on the intel that you've got, the data that you've seen, the information that you have, but that is not all of the information because fraudsters have already figured out how to get around that. So I guess the lesson of today, other than me talking about synthetic refund fraud, the lesson of today is to make sure that your threat intel is good. That's, I mean, I, I really can't stress that enough. I can't. We have to, uh, if you can, if, if the person that's giving you threat intel is intel that you could get from a Google search or by going on a publicly available criminal channel. So you, you download the Tor browser and you start to visit Dread. And the information that this consultant or security company has been giving you is information that's all from there. Or you go on Telegram and you simply search refunding and you start reading some of the public channels that's available to anyone who downloads Telegram. And all of the information that this consultant or security company has been giving you is from there. And there's nothing new at all that's not publicly being discussed there. That's a problem. That's a huge problem. So I'm, I'm urging people out there, merchants, to make sure that your threat intel is good. Now, this is a uh, this is our first episode of the Brett Johnson Show. This is an important episode because not a, I'm back for one thing. I'm back. We're going to have shows every Monday and Thursday. Today's episode, the first one is synthetic refund fraud. And uh, it's important to discuss because it's a technique that merchants, a lot of merchants don't know about. They've not been told about, and it's currently in play and it's simply ramping up. That's all it's going to do. It's going to continue to ramp up. All right. Until you're forced to look at it. All right. So bear that in mind. Brett Johnson show. What kind of tagline we got? I don't know. How about stay safe, stay secure, stay vigilant. Ah, I like that. I like that. How about the Brett Johnson show? Do the right thing. I'm Brett Johnson. Until next time, thank you for tuning in.